Welcome back to the second section of the on-chain scaling conference, uh, Encore edition. And it's my pleasure now to introduce our next presentation from Emin Gunzir. Emin Gunzir is a professor of computer science at Cornell University, where he is also a co-director for the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Smart Contracts. His research focuses on all things related to decentralized systems. His group is known for having discovered and fixed the selfish mining attack, having developed Bitcoin NG, a next generation protocol that is compatible with Bitcoin that supports visa level scale on chain, having deployed Falcon, a relay network to improve mining decentralization, and having proposed Bitcoin vaults, a technique to deter thefts of Bitcoins at rest. Today, Gun will be sharing on chain scaling for the next generation, and I would like to please welcome Emin Gansir. Thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming on board and having me on here. Um, I want to talk to you about Bitcoin uh, NG, Bitcoin Next Generation, um, and the core idea here is going to be a slightly different way of building blockchains. Okay, so let's get started. So um, I'm going to skip right through the introduction. Obviously, Bitcoin is an amazing, amazing invention with great potential. And uh, we've all uh, in, invested substantial portions of our lives in making it better. And um, the potential, though, seems a little uh, stuck on dry land at the moment in the sense that, uh, that there isn't a clear path to scaling for the next generation. That is, the current level of scale um, seems uh, 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 um, not able to support, uh, let's say, the needs of a small nation. And anytime a nation anywhere has a problem, like we did in the case of Greece, uh, the Bitcoin community gets very excited because potentially many, many, many people could come on board and enjoy the benefits that Bitcoin offers. And yet, if you look at what is actually possible, um, it, if Greece were to convert to using, uh, using Bitcoin, every Greek citizen gets to do a transaction every 32 days or so. So that clearly isn't going to support the needs of, uh, of, uh, of a demanding populace. So where are we then? Well, that leaves us in a quandary because if we were to take Bitcoin as given to us and try to make it scale up, it seems that there are only two paths ahead of us. One is to reparameterize Bitcoin, to try to make uh, some of the parameters, tweak some of the parameters, say the block size, and, uh, and try to admit more transactions per second that way. Another way to do it is to seek for solutions at higher layers say the Lightning Network or payment channels and so forth. And that's fine too. Um, I want to show you a third way. And this third way avoids having to, uh, to fight the block size debate uh, to, to try to decide what exact setting of a parameter will actually get you uh, the properties that makes the vast majority of people out there happy because it seems like there is really no such intersection out there. And it also avoids the problem of with layer two solutions, and I'll touch upon those uh, towards the end. So let's see. So what's, uh, what's the current situation with Bitcoin? Everybody knows how the Bitcoin blockchain works. We have blocks built upon blocks uh, approximately every 10 minutes. These blocks are one megabyte in size. That comes out to about three and a half transactions per second with average transaction sizes, maybe seven if you were to use the smallest possible transactions, and that's what you've got. That's nowhere near where we want to be. We need a couple more orders of magnitude. Uh, in addition, there are secondary problems. Um, one of them is uh, the latency of a confirmation. So the so-called coffee problem. Now, I don't necessarily believe that every coffee purchase has to be on the blockchain, but I also do believe that if I want to have a low latency confirmation, if I want to do a, a quick sale, say a local Bitcoin transaction, I shouldn't have to sit there for an hour. So it should be possible to get some some uh, some assurance that my transaction went through from the system without having to sit there and wonder what's happening. And the third one, of course, is variability under load. We saw with the spam attacks, we saw with uh, the various uh, uh, you know, durations of stress that the network went through that uh, there can be high variability under load. Um, and you know, perhaps this is normal for every system, uh, but for Bitcoin, it actually leads to highly embarrassing situations. People with stuck transactions wondering what's going on and so forth. And ideally, we'd like something that would avoid these problems. So 
Where does that uh, take us to? Well, one way to, to approach this is the reparameterization re debate. So let's take, uh, you'll notice, of course, the background for the slide is a very well chosen bike shed. Um, what one can do uh, to increase scalability is to make the blocks larger. That's one way of making um, Bitcoin admit more transactions per second. Another way that's almost isomorphic is to um, is to divide the blocks, so it's to issue the blocks uh, at a higher clip. Uh, say instead of every 10 minutes, you issue them every minute or every 10 seconds or whatever, what have you. And there are countless different BIPs and countless different suggested schedules for block size increases that have been debated to death by the community. In fact, this issue has really fractured the community, has, has surfaced, caused um, you know, a lot of bad, uh, bad behaviors to surface. Uh, that have actually really been toxic, in my view, uh, to the health of the community. So um, no matter how you cut this, though, um, the, the real issue with both of these approaches is that as you try to get more blocks of larger blocks sent from one miner to all the other miners, or more frequent blocks sent from one miner to all the other miners, you might end up with forks. And forks lead to wasted effort. And to avoid the wasted effort, the miners would then uh, have an incentive to centralize, and that would, of course, then take away the, the core benefits of our beloved protocol. So this is the, uh, the core issue. There are other ancillary issues that I'm not going to touch upon, but uh, this is the, the heart of the debate right here. So that means that we have some sort of a, a trade-off here. We can make the block size bigger to get higher throughput. We can make the block frequency higher to get lower latency. And these are both good, but they happen at the cost of centralization or worries about centralization. And when we looked at this, when we looked at what we can do, what the, what the limits of uh, reparameterization are, uh, we had a paper, this is the paper on which I worked with the most number of, uh, of uh, co-authors. I even lost count, maybe 12 of us. Um, we took as given the uh, stated goal, which was to retain 95% of the full nodes on the network. And if that's your goal, then uh, it, it is not the case that you can reach visa level scale by reparameterizing the protocol, by, by making the in fact, it's not safe to make the blocks bigger than four mega megabytes. Uh, now, after four megabytes, you know, people disagree on where you can put the line, uh, but we all agree that at some point, and not, not too far from where we are, we reach a limit uh, where nodes start to drop out, and that's bad for the network. So what can we do? And uh, this was our starting point when we started to look at the uh, Bitcoin NG work. It turns out that there is a path out of the current morass, that there is a way to make this protocol scale without having to resort to unknown or, or sort of uh, as yet uncharted territory on layer two. And there is a way to do this without having to fight this, uh, this really uh, uh, difficult battle of trying to set the setting in a communal fashion. Uh, anybody who's shared an office at some point with a bunch of other people and tried to set the thermostat knows that it's just impossible to find a setting that's going to make everyone happy. So what's our insight? Well, here is one insight, or the main insight behind Bitcoin NG. If you were to look at how Bitcoin works, um, deep down, the way it works is every miner is sitting on a whole bunch of, uh, of, of transactions and, uh, that have not been encoded in the blockchain. These transactions are essentially free-floating. And uh, on occasion, it manages to solve a crypto puzzle, at which point it has a good block and uh, it tries to, to work frantically to get that block to other miners so that uh, the, the miner can reclaim her rewards and all the other miners can, uh, can build on it. So that's fine. And what's really happening here is that the miner is encoding in stone what happened in the preceding 10 minutes. That's the way Bitcoin works. If you were to spin this around and build a slightly different protocol where the miner is not necessarily encoding what happened in the past, but instead gains the right to encode what is about to happen in the future. That is, block creation is not retroactive, but, but, uh, but applies to the future. So then the protocol ends up having amazing properties that are far, far better than what we have today. So let me illustrate how this works. The, uh, the Bitcoin NG approach starts with taking a block, and we all know that the block consists of uh, a proof of work, and a, a coin base and a series of uh, transactions and breaking it into two. 
So what I'm going to call key blocks are uh, very much akin to current blocks that we have now. So they're issued every 10 minutes. They contain a crypto puzzle, proof of work, and they contain the equivalent of a they contain a Coinbase transaction in addition to a key. So that key is then able to mint what we are calling microblocks. And microblocks can be issued um, depending on how you want to do this. So they can be issued at will, or if you want to place a limit on it, you can always place a limit on it and issue them every 10 seconds and so on. So that key is assigned subsequent microblocks to come afterwards. In essence, if you want to view this as, um, as a, a, a process of electing a miner to be the sort of the maestro uh, that then issues of micro blocks unfettered until the election of the next miner, that's probably the best way to view it. So key blocks are going to be very small, so that makes them really easy to disseminate throughout the network, and they're going to be fairly rare. They're going to be as rare as blocks are currently. Micro blocks, in contrast, are going to be also small, but they're going to be very frequent. We want them to be issued to the those transactions come in. So instead of maintaining a mempool and having things sit there and every 10 minutes being issued, uh, issuing a new block, uh, instead a miner is going to have uh, a, a mempool-like thing, but it's going to be converting that mempool into a series of micro blocks as fast as it can or as fast as the protocol allows her to. So let me illustrate this. Um, this slide shows the uh, tail of a blockchain. And, uh, this miner um, issues uh, discovers a block as a good proof of work, and um, that then is the key that's going to be minted in the microblocks. This election process, uh, we use the phrase leader election, and that got some people confused. We're not electing a leader by any kind of an identifier. Your IP address is of no concern to us. It's not divulged anywhere. Uh, the amount of info leaked or, or exposed here is identical to Bitcoin. There's just a key. That key can then be used to issue these uh, micro blocks that I'm showing in, as circles. So what you would see as serialized transactions in a regular Bitcoin block, we would actually issue as a series of micro, in a, in a Bitcoin block, we would issue as a series of micro blocks in Bitcoin NG. So the process has been split into two phases. One is the uh, key election phase, and the next one is the serialization phase. So these micro blocks depend on each other in the typical blockchain fashion. They include the hash of the last micro block. So this process continues forever and ever um, until um, another, um, another miner discovers a key block. So when that happens, typically what will happen is that uh, that miner shown in yellow here is not going to know all of the micro blocks issued by the blue, the pre preceding miner. So we expect some sort of a, a, a such a micro fork, if you will, um, to to happen when uh, the new key blocks are issued. Uh, some of these, uh, you know, the suffix of this uh, this uh, chain uh, might be lost, and that's perfectly normal and part of the protocol. So, um, as usual, when uh, a second miner appears on the scene and uh, discovers a key block, uh, it becomes the next uh, miner to mint and starts minting micro blocks shown in yellow over here. The interval between two key blocks is our good old usual 10 minute interval. So at this point, there are a couple of issues. The most important of which is, um, why would anybody do this? Is this an incentive pro uh, compatible protocol? I want to talk to you a little bit about this. I'm not going to get into too many details, uh, but I do want to uh, illustrate that, uh, that this is, we thought a little not, not a little. We thought quite a bit about the incentive structure and this protocol is compatible. So the reward structure in Bitcoin, as you will remember, is that there is a, a block reward uh, given to any miner who discovers a good uh, block, um, in addition to transaction fees uh, that all, all together go to the same miner who discovered the, um, the uh, block, the, the proof of work. So. Um, Okay, that's what this, uh, this slide shows. In Bitcoin NG, things are a little different, um, not drastically different, but somewhat different, um, in the sense that um, we ha still have the block reward issued on schedule like every other Bitcoin block reward um, with the 21 million cap, et cetera, uh, the halvings and so forth. 
Um, and they go to the miner who discovered the key block. So when you discover your block, you still get your 12 and a, and a half bitcoins at the moment. So the difference is with the micro blocks. We'd like to make sure that, uh, that the subsequent miner to come after you has an incentive to incorporate as many of your micro blocks as possible. And um, I'm not going to bore you with the details of this process uh, of how to do this, but I will mention how we do it um, at a very sort of high level, which is the following. In Bitcoin NG, the transaction fees are split between the previous miner and the subsequent miner. So that um, not only do you get some reward for including a transaction as a micro block for issuing one, uh, but the person that who comes after you also gets a reward. And uh, the particular uh, choice of the split uh, is subject to several constraints. The paper that we had uh, that was published and peer reviewed at NSTI uh, last year, about a year ago, uh, goes through the full derivation. Uh, but uh, it comes down to finding a split uh, that uh, incentivizes both sides and uh, and respects all of the constraints. It turns out that 4060 is a, there's a big range for the split, but 4060 is a fine, fine location. So uh, this micro block that is shown in blue here uh, contains a transaction, 40% of whose fees go to the, the, um, the, the blue miner, 60% goes to the red miner. And uh, this then leads to an incentive compatible protocol structure. So, um, the kinds of attacks that this prohibits are, are twofold. One is what we call hiding microblocks, and the other one is ignoring microblocks. Um, uh, once again, um, I'm having more detailed questions on this, but uh, uh, the paper goes through the full derivation. So let's see. Um, what are the advantages of Bitcoin NG? Well, one of the main things it does is it's friendly block dissemination activity by a much smoother time dilated block creation process. So we no longer have to sit idle for long periods of time, 10 minutes, an eternity, and then suddenly work like hell to try to get those, those blocks to the other miners. I know just how hard we work at this because my group actually deployed a system called Falcon, uh, which is an, uh, an add-on, if you will, to the Bitcoin network, uh, like the Bitcoin relay network, but uses a different technique to, uh, to disseminate blocks. So um, getting rid of that, that frantic activity is really, really crucial. It fundamentally addresses centralization concerns. The throughput of the network can be as high as the network will allow. So what does that mean? Uh, there's no limit of a block size, and I don't have to worry about you know, one megabyte over 10 minutes. Uh, we can issue these micro blocks as fast as, we, as the network will bear. So obviously, if you, if you crank that up to a, uh, a micro block every you know, then, then the network will not be able to bear it, so there should be some limits on that front. But those limits are far in excess of what we have today. Um, let's see. We get also, in addition to throughput, we get some amazing other features out of this uh, structure of the way blocks are minted. Uh, the, one of the most important ones is lower latency confirmation. Bitcoin at the moment merchants go you know, for all of the, the, uh, the strong guarantees of Bitcoin by accepting zero cons transactions. And we have a secondary, really heated debate over RDF replaced by fees. And uh, we can avoid that because in NG we have this notion of uh, there is no need for conf transactions because a block in a, uh, sorry, a transaction in, a, in an NG micro block is strictly stronger than a zero conf transaction. If you want the full guarantee, of course, you will have to actually wait uh, until, uh, until six key blocks have passed. And overall, um, NG makes the same trust assumptions as Bitcoin. I did not introduce any new magical third parties. There are no hubs, there are no spokes, there are no middlemen uh, holding down money or anything of the kind. It's just the same old, good old uh, trust assumptions as we always had. Uh, it's just a slightly different mechanism for minting the blocks. So there have been, uh, when this was discussed, there were a bunch of issues raised. And the way this works, of course, online with social media is you get, uh, I don't know, people have, uh, uh, there are a lot of people who make a lot of noise in this space. I want to talk about uh, some of the non-concerns. Um, there was a soundbite issued by one person that says that NG requires uh, some form of identity. That is absolutely false. 
Liners are identified solely by a key, just like now. There's absolutely no difference between uh, what we do and what Bitcoin does. Um, second issue is uh, NG is robust to misbehavior. There are lots of possible misbehaviors uh, by miners, and um, miners can mint empty blocks. Um, miners and clients can collude so that a client the transaction to a miner where the fee is not in the transaction but is in the transaction. So these are all issues that can happen with Bitcoin. It can also happen with NG. Um, the, uh, uh, the former case is exactly identical. Miners just mint micro blocks. If they do, that's fine. Time will pass. Another miner will come in and will mint another key block and on. Just the same way we mon from a miner today. Uh, who mints empty blocks. In fact, we fix that by placing social pressure on miners. Uh, the second issue is, yes, you could always uh, not, not obey the protocol and distribute fees out of band. That causes absolutely no problems for the protocol itself and has absolutely no implications about the incentive compatibility of the protocol. You will hurt yourself and uh, it would be, it'd be uh, you know, it'd, it's something that's possible, but why would you do it? So um, there is one issue that, uh, uh, that has some teeth, which is currently pooled miners have some say over transaction selection through get block template. So if I'm a miner working for a pool, um, I'm getting my block template from the pool, uh, pool controller, and I can actually then modify perhaps uh, the uh, transactions in my, in my block. Um, now, I don't know how many people actually care or, or do anything about this, um, but, uh, but uh, with Bitcoin NG, uh, it's possible to do the same thing, and, uh, but to do so, we would have to have new APIs between the, um, the, um, the miners that are part of the pool and the pool operator. So let's see. Um, what's the impact of this on the max block size debate? So at the high level, the, uh, the block size debate has been waged unscientifically. I think Jeff really put his finger on it when he said uh, that, that Bitcoin had a number of constants that were sort of like finger in the wind kind of constants. And um, whenever you design a system, there are lots and lots and lots of, uh, of parameters that somebody has to pick, right? You, you just kind of have to, uh, somebody has to decide how many peers to maintain, how, you know, how often to ping them and so forth. Um, and well, of course, one of them, a key one, has, turns out to be a block size. Now, um, when it's time to pick these parameters, one cannot rely on gut feelings and vague concerns. Or one can, but then we'll find ourselves in a morass as we did. And, um, and what has happened, of course, is the specter of centralization has been used to raise fear, uncertainty, and doubt about all sorts of protocol changes. And uh, what, what I think my main takeaway, you know, there, really there are two takeaways from this talk. One is how Bitcoin NG works. It works by turning everything upside down. Um, second one is, you know, if you're going to design a protocol, you ought to do it in a scientific manner. This is really a discipline. It's not just a gut feeling, I, I feel very, very worried about this, that, or the other kind of a scenario. It's really just a science or an engineering discipline. There's no room here for feelings and worries. And the right way to do this is by quantifying things. So this is how we conduct science. This is how we build bridges. This is how we build all sorts of things. That's, there should be, there's no reason why Bitcoin should be exempt from this. So what we need here is a scientific foundation for evaluating protocols. The debate so far has been conducted without identifying of importance, without quantifying crucial properties of a protocol, or without evaluating pro proposals quantitatively. So I would like to ask of the people who are listening to this, I think most of them are a super techie audience, um, but I know that some people you know, perhaps might not care about the details of the, the, the gory details of the underlying operation of a protocol, but I think everybody uh, should be demanding more of the participants discussion, especially about the scaling discussion. We need to demand that proposals and arguments be accompanied by real data and quantitative reasoning. That's the only way to get out of the current morass. We need better reasoned arguments, we need a reduction in the, the signal to noise rate or improvement in the signal to noise, no, noise ratio. And uh, most importantly, what this will do is it will actually make it impossible for certain type of individuals to actually participate in this debate. Yes, you're very worried about something or another, but if you haven't shown that it's actually a quantitative problem, then, then that's just the worry that you have. It's, it's not a real worry for anyone. 
I'm really worried that my engine will explode. Really? No, no, you shouldn't be. So uh, what did we do? So we came up with the Bitcoin NG idea, and then we found ourselves just into this a bit. No one before us had actually looked at metrics for evaluating watching protocols. This is kind of a strange scenario. Um, and so we had to devise our own, uh, our own metrics for deciding which protocol is better than which other protocol. And uh, so the paper that we have um, goes through the details on this, but uh, I will mention four metrics of importance. One of them is mining power utilization. This is a crucial metric. It refers to the percent of power spent by miners that is, uh, that is utilized to the blockchain. Anything else is wasted. We'd like to, um, to keep waste to a minimum. Uh, high orphan rates drive miners away. It's, uh, it's really a disconcerting issue. It's just you know, uh, ecologically uh, wasteful. Second is fairness, which is the percent of blocks mined by the non-dominant miner. And this, again, is a crucial uh, property. And uh, you know, if you have, let's say, 5% of the hash power, what percent of the blocks on the ultimate blockchain do you get to own? And uh, the better the protocol, the higher the um, We also came up with the notion of a consensus delay. So how long does it take for nodes to decide, for nodes to come into consensus? if you will, or how far behind in the blockchain do I have to look until I agree with a certain percentage of the participants in the network. And uh, finally, uh, the time to win and time to prune are um, metrics that examine how long it takes for um, uh, the blockchain, the unwanted items in the blockchain to be pruned. So no, not the unwanted, but the, the contented, contented items in the uh, blockchain to be pruned. So, um, okay, so these are the metrics that we examined. And, um, and the next thing we did was, well, we need a, a platform to actually evaluate these things. Metrics are good, but we somehow need to, to, to decide if protocol X is better than protocol Y or how they behave under, under, um, uh, you know, uh, under different scenarios. So to that end, we started building this thing that we're calling miniature world. Uh, those of you who've been to, um, I think it's a very European thing. Uh, there are a lot of European cities where you go to them, to these miniature worlds where they have a miniature copy of another city, right? So you go to Frankfurt and there's a miniature Beijing or whatever. So what we're building at Cornell is a miniature copy of the entire Bitcoin network. So uh, ultimately the vision is for every node anybody runs out there, every Bitcoin node that anybody runs out there, we'd like to have a virtual copy of it in the basement of the Cornell Computer Science Department. Uh, we have a very, very large cluster there. Um, and, uh, uh, and indeed, this is the, the vision that we're going towards. And, and you know, about 7,000 nodes is actually fairly uh, uh, feasible to simulate in the size of cluster that we have. So the numbers I'm about to show you are coming to you not from a one-to-one -one replica, but from a one-to-six replica. And uh, what we did was to go through and collect data from every single one of the, uh, the nodes out there. We collected bandwidth data, latency data. Uh, we collected protocol level traffic data. And we also looked at temporal variations, what happens uh, over time um, with regard to bandwidth and latency, and also traffic, um, because we're sharing the network with other, other flows as well. So, that allowed us to build an emulation testbed, this thing that we're calling miniature world. So on this testbed, we run actual code. So we can take Bitcoin foo for any foo and just run it on our platform. It's, uh, it's just emulated. We're running the exact same code as, uh, as was issued. Numbers I'm about to show you come from Bitcoin uh, 0 0.10 dot something or another that we used uh, that was the most, the latest at the time we did our testing. Let's see. So then we have a large test bed, and uh, it's quite efficient because uh, you know it's just we are not doing any mining. Uh, it's realistic because it's copying the real world, and it can actually allow us to perform uh, replicable experiments. We can run scenarios and rerun them in the simulation test bed and see how the protocols perform. And uh, from there, we measure these metrics, the four that I mentioned before. 
So let's see. So our setup here is uh, going to be, I'm going to show you some of the measurements we've performed. Uh, the setup is uh, quite realistic. We have a mining power distribution uh, that appears as follows. This is the ratio of mining power that, has, that is based on, uh, on uh, measurements from the actual Bitcoin network. So this first graph is showing the mining power utilization. And uh, here we're, we're using really frequent blocks. Uh, everything is normalized to the same baseline. And uh, so what you're seeing here is the effect of making the block size larger and larger. And uh, you can see that um, as you do this, just as predicted, um, Bitcoin starts to, to suffer uh, in terms of utilization because there are more and more orphans. If the blocks are bigger and bigger, um, it is, it's quite easy for miners to end up uh, losing, uh, losing blocks that they have discovered. So Bitcoin NG, in contrast, does not suffer from this. You can see that uh, that line is, is a straight line up there. And you can see, of course, the uh, quantiles uh, shown here. And uh, it's actually incredibly tight, this performance. So um, let's see. So this, is, uh, this next graph is showing um, the same metric, mining power utilization, as a function of block frequency. And uh, because the two are isomorphic, once again, you're pretty much seeing the same, uh, same behavior. The next uh, thing that one might want to look at is fairness. So in this case, we're looking at Bitcoin versus Bitcoin NG. And uh, what percentage of block non-leading miner is able to get into the um, blockchain? And uh, as you can see, as you make the block size bigger, fairness drops substantially with, uh, with Bitcoin and not at all so with Bitcoin NG. Okay, and um, so this is the same graph with block frequency uh, showing fairness as a function of block frequency. So finally, this is consensus delay, so which, is, uh, which captures uh, the, uh, the, the sort of the, the delay over which um, uh, after which uh, the 90th percentile of the network is in agreement, and uh, there is about an order of magnitude difference. This is a log scale graph, order of magnitude difference between Bitcoin and Bitcoin NG. So where does that take us? That takes us to a point where we have a scalable blockchain protocol. It's about, uh, well, for the experiments that we performed uh, with a cap on micro blocks that limit them to being issued every 10 seconds. Uh, we have a uh, 30, about 28 uh, times transaction increase in transaction throughput. And uh, at the same time, the uh, latency for uh, a single confirmation is, uh, or a microblock latency is, uh, is a tiny, tiny fraction. Within uh, 10 seconds, you have a microblock issued. And um, uh, in contrast, uh, you'd have to, you know, that, that's much, much better than sitting there without knowing what's happening for about 10 minutes. We also have come up with new metrics for evaluating blockchain protocols. We've performed large-scale experiments to quantify robustness and scalability of, uh, of NG as well as other protocols. So there is a lot of related work. I'm sure I'm going to get a bunch of questions about it. Layer 2 protocols, reparameterization, you know, all sorts of systems that are built on proof of work and PBFT. Um, so let me just say a few words about Layer 2 protocols. Uh, they're absolutely wonderful. They certainly have a place to uh, a role to play in any network, and you could always layer a layer two protocol, and they're fantastic. And, and whenever they're appropriate, we should use them. But layer two protocols are not a layer two protocol that shares Bitcoin syntax is not Bitcoin. So Lightning is not Bitcoin. It has it's going to have emergent properties that differ drastically from Bitcoin itself. I am concerned about privacy issues with Lightning. I'm concerned about the routing that's going to be used, concerned about information leakage through the routing protocol, about capacities and other uh, pre-established relationships between individuals in the network. I am concerned about, uh, um, about um, uh, the user experience. So um, uh, you know, if you think that Bitcoin is complicated, try explaining Bitcoin and Lightning to your uh, typical user. Uh, and if you think that wallets can somehow hide this, um, well, I don't know. Uh, you must not have been reading the forums where people constantly complain about you know, uh, something as simple as a stuck transaction. Now we're going to have to ask, well, where did it get stuck? And uh, the answer is quite complicated. So. Um, Overall, I think I'm, uh, the bulk of the discussion here is going to happen in the question uh, period, but um, 
Uh, this is an incredible time to be uh, to be working on, on blockchains and cryptocurrencies, and um, there's a, a new new fundamentally new technology in in our hands. Um, there's clearly a lot of interest from the fintech industry in this stuff, um, but there cannot be a revolution without principles. Is we're going to start, you know, every revolution eats its own people, as, uh, as I think uh, Robespierre said. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the blockchain uh, protocols need to be science-based. Otherwise, we're going to just, uh, just be stuck in some kind of a morass that doesn't have any forward path at all. And it's going to simply bring down uh, the community. And there cannot be a small-scale revolution uh, for, for Bitcoin to, to win. It has to scale. So I'll leave, I think, on the note that a scientific approach to the design of blockchain protocols can yield systems with strong properties. And, uh, and I think with that, I'm going to start taking questions. Oh, this is OK. So Mike Adams is, uh, um, is upset that uh, I'm saying I said something that, uh, that the promise of Bitcoin seems to be stalled. OK, well, I think there are a lot of uh, Bitcoin maximalists um, who cannot handle any criticism. And I think the beginning of science is to say, well, there's an objective reality out there, and uh, that exceeds any one of us. And we need to sort of look at it and say, well, um, this is what it is. And, uh, so Mike thinks that it's not stalled, but uh, I do not see an increase at the moment uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, well, I haven't seen an increase in what the network can scale to in a long, long time. I know that SegWit is in the works, and uh, when it's deployed and uh, adopted by clients and so forth, then we will see an improvement. Well, uh, that's, that's fine. So Jameson Lop has asked, uh, how would you compare and contrast Bitcoin NG's microblocks against Bitcoin's weak blocks proposal? So weak blocks is, a, is an interesting idea um, wherein miners distribute the block that they're working on with a, typically a, a, and you can't do this willy-nilly because if you were to do this willy-nilly, then the network and you've opened up a DOS vector. So what you then have to do is you need to come up with some kind of a easier uh, crypto puzzle uh, that prohibits people from, uh, from just willy-nilly pushing these out. So weak blocks are fine. I think they're not fair to small miners because the easy, uh, the easy solution uh, for a small miner might be difficult to compute. And uh, so it puts them at an enormous disadvantage. At the very low end of the scale, I think weak blocks don't work at all. And um, uh, the other issue, of course, is weak blocks is strictly, uh, in terms of bandwidth, strictly higher than, uh, requires much higher bandwidth than uh, Bitcoin NG. And if you start hoping for and actually moving towards a world where you have lots and lots of miners, the weak blocks take uh, much more bandwidth to push around. I think that's, uh, that summarizes my thoughts on that issue. Um, Andrew Stone is asking uh, about uh, an interesting issue, and I think I should raise this. So he says, I see an incentive to not orphan microblocks, but no guarantee. It seems like the additional guarantee relies on the profit uh, and self-interest of miners, uh, similarly to a transaction fee. Um, so for example, a high fee double spend would incentivize the N, N plus one block to a bunch of microblocks to grab the to grab the double spend in its own microblocks. Um, so, uh, so he says that uh, uh, Bitcoin NG um, might have dangling microblocks are cheaply orphaned. So uh, let's see. So let's actually take a, uh, this is moving too much for me, but okay. So let's take a second to actually uh, try to figure out what's going on. I think Andrew is entirely right that there's in distributed systems a big difference between strong guarantees provided by uh, some kind of a proof uh, that comes with the protocol uh, in, that is mechanistic in its operation uh, versus game theoretic incentives that depend on, uh, on that actually try to achieve an, a, 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 a desired outcome. So uh, it's absolutely true that uh, the latter are weaker than, uh, is weaker than uh, the, the former. So if you can actually guarantee that people will absolutely obey every single aspect of a protocol, uh, then you're golden. But we can't do that. Bitcoin doesn't do that, and Bitcoin NG doesn't do that. I can deviate from the Bitcoin protocol in all sorts of ways, and we showed with selfish mining that, in fact, some of these deviations can lead to, to loss. Um, 
for Bitcoin energy, the particular situation that he is identifying here um, is uh, um, is uh, what is it? A high fee double spend would incentivize the end. Okay, so indeed, so he's actually uh, discussing an attack on uh, somebody who takes a micro block as payment, and that's absolutely true. That if you take a uh, a micro block as payment. Uh, then a double spend attack, uh, paying a miner can actually cause an orphaning to happen. This is true for Bitcoin. It's also true for Bitcoin NG. So if you're selling high value items, you should wait. You should wait for the next key block to be issued. And that is no different than Bitcoin. Let's see. Um, so Free Trader is asking an interesting question. He's inquiring about the overlay proposal to introduce NG on top of uh, current Bitcoin. So we spent a bit of time about how one could actually roll this out. Um, and uh, one of the potential ways of rolling this out is uh, to, uh, to do the following, to actually build NG as a layer on top of Bitcoin. That is, you would have some NG miners out there and you'd have some oblivious Bitcoin miners. And when two NG miners um, issue transactions, issue blocks uh, one after another, then uh, they issue blocks one after another and they respect each other's blocks, the micro blocks are extended and so forth. Um, and, um, and when Bitcoin miners come in that are oblivious, then they interrupt the NG chain. And uh, this has interesting, uh, interesting implications. It means that you can, you can incrementally roll NG out on top of Bitcoin. There are a couple of nuances. It's a little hard to do this without uh, slides and, uh, and sort of uh, uh, additional material, but I'll try to do it very quickly. What it means is, uh, 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 okay, so it has the following implication. You can start rolling this out, and as people adopt NG, then you can end up having, um, um, having the network suddenly uh, convert at some situation. There's something like a phase shift that happens, and there is a, a, a lot of NG. Is that that start to form, and that's a fantastic outcome because then the network works efficiently. Um, and G blocks deployed in this fashion must be compatible with Bitcoin blocks, so the key blocks have to be big. They actually have to encode everything that happened in the preceding micro blocks. So you're not getting the full benefit until you can convert, but you're at least rolling it out, and it will be a, a graceful, uh, graceful um, upgrade path. Uh, if you're interested in, uh, in the details of how this uh, process works, our um, covenants paper goes into, into some detail about this. Um, what about the problem of, so Paul is asking, what about the problem of not being able to support the 4060 split because wallets can pay fees directly to miners? Um, uh, that is, uh, that's, uh, this, we keep getting this question, um, and, um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I keep addressing it, but let me try and do this um, uh, sort of uh, informally, and it might be better than trying to type it all out repeatedly. So it's just not a big deal um, that I can pay a miner um, in a manner that does not, not obey the 4060 split. I can do this today, right? I can uh, do a transaction for 1.1 1 .1, uh, Bitcoin, where the 0.1 is a transaction fee, let's say. Or I can split it. I can uh, issue a transaction for 1 Bitcoin and pay the 0.1 to a particular miner uh, out of band. So uh, the, the worry is, uh, is, is whether or not doing so is, uh, is, a, dominate, uh, is a dominating strategy over going through with the four Split, and it's not. So, um, and I think that's really all I have to say. But but let me try and explain why that it's not the, why it's not the case. So, if you were to do this, um, yes, you will be able to pay a particular miner to include something uh, uh, a micro block. Um, but then the miner that comes after him has no incentive to actually build on that particular low fee or no fee transaction. You'd, you'd have been better off to actually put the fee in there so that the next person who comes after him incorporates that, blo that, uh, that micro block. So by working against this, the, the protocol, the fee distribution, you ended up making it more likely for your uh, micro block to be orphaned. Uh, this might have been an issue if somehow operating at this point actually paid the miners more. But in reality, the fees that are being paid are the same, and a miner with a particular hash power will collect the same uh, percentage one way or the other. So that I think should give you some intuition for why the split is the way it is. And uh, there are two particular constraints that are derived in the paper. 
and uh, that, uh, that uh, go into this in more detail. So let's see. Uh, there's a question that says, how are fees distributed? Uh, is there a rounding error? Um, rounding errors can always uh, occur with any system. Uh, we would use fixed point arithmetic to avoid this. Um, and, uh, you know, and it's, as I said, the particular ratio is, uh, is not, uh, uh, there's a wide range of selection, so it's easy to fix something that does not suffer from, uh, from rounding, um, a schedule that doesn't suffer from rounding problems. Can Bitcoin NG be hard forked in? Yes, absolutely. It can be hard forked in. Uh, it can also be, as I described, built on top and de deployed incrementally. Here's a good question. Will Bitcoin NG work when the block reward is zero? Um, I'm going to defer this question because I don't want to open up uh, Pandora's box. Um, but I'm going to say that uh, there's a bigger question that we should all worry about, which is, will Bitcoin work when the block reward is zero? And um, I have some colleagues at Princeton who've done extensive work on this. And uh, modeling what happens when the block reward is zero is actually quite difficult. And uh, the answer is, is fairly complicated and nuanced. So, um, okay, so here's a question. What are your plans for releasing Bitcoin NG? Uh, we'd love to release it. We did most of the code and uh, it's based on uh, slightly dated code now. We'd have to upgrade it. Um, but, uh, but it's a lot of work at that, well, it's not a lot. It's just work without uh, particular specific payoff at the moment. So um, we thought about the fork a long time ago, and at the time we thought that's, that's, uh, that's a rather malicious thing to do. Um, uh, and it's much better for a community to, to govern itself and come up with a solution. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, so we're, we can release the code as is. That's uh, something we can do. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, we'd love to see this deployed in, uh, in some form or another. Um, let's see. There's a, there's a question that's very specific about some of the experiments. Let me skip them for a second. Um, would you compare extent scaling to NG scaling? Uh, that's uh, okay. So let's talk a little bit about extend blocks. Um, that's uh, an interesting proposal. Um, uh, I don't know. So uh, what's there to say about extend scaling versus NG scaling? Um, so you know, actually, well, I, I'll just defer. So we're getting short on time. Uh, I don't want to get into the extend scaling discussion too much because I cannot actually recall the extend um, uh, operation off the top of my head. So that comparison is a little difficult. Let me try and do a, um, a blog post about it, uh, and that might be a better way to address it. So uh, here is a final question that I'm seeing here. How do we, uh, so we've got a great proposal, and it's about time someone used science and actual data to further the field. How do we make it happen? Who has to be convinced? And what's the chance that it will happen? Uh, I'm not sure. I think uh, I don't want to point fingers at anyone. I think every one of the core devs actually wants to, to, to elevate the discussion. That's very clear. Uh, all sorts of people on both sides of the fence have made efforts to make the discussion quantitative. Um, and, um, and I've seen this personally myself on the, the, the mailing list and so forth. So, uh, so there is push for this. Um, I think as a community, we have to calm down a little bit about these uh, potentially contentious discussions. Uh, we have to push back on people who are being toxic. I think there's a lot of that happening. Um, we have to demand science from all the participants. And that will just gradually put a force field on everyone to behave better. I think uh, this community has been very accepting of all sorts of activities of um, uh, that uh, that I would consider maybe haven't been so great. So you know anybody who says anything slightly negative, um, you know that's that's about Bitcoin. They get pilloried. I've watched uh, Shamir get attacked, and that's just crazy. Uh, I mean, you're using his techniques left, right, and center all the time, and um, and uh, he needs to be accorded much more respect. I've seen all sorts of other researchers get. Uh, uh, get attacked just because every research discussion has to start with, well, there's a problem over here that we think is a problem. Um, so, uh, or somebody just comes up with a factual measurement about the, the percentage of, um, you know, just yesterday, a colleague of mine did a, I came up with a study about the percentage of exchanges that have been hacked and suddenly everybody goes wild and starts, you know, attacking him and so forth. And, and really, we should be able to handle criticism. If you're confident in your technology, if you really have something that's going to change the world, then, uh, 
uh, you know, then, then you're confident. You can take some criticism. It's okay if somebody says, you know, security isn't necessarily one of the, the greatest strengths of Bitcoin, right? So Bitcoin itself is fine. The protocol is fine. But wallet security, not so good. Um, sorry, exchange security, not so good. Good. So we can we can handle this kind of criticism, and we're we're going to be better off for it. So so you know if I'm going to point fingers, I think it's all of us. We really need to do a better job uh, altogether. So Jerry says, I don't think Bitcoin will work very well if rewards are zero. Yes, I think uh, he's 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 right. Um, uh, just so that the um, uh, the listeners know about this problem. Um, imagine what happens when, on occasion, somebody drops a uh, what I call a, a, a goose egg, a golden goose egg. Uh, so that is a transaction with a giant transaction fee. We had one of these uh, just recently in the last couple of months, where there was a hundred and seventeen thousand dollar transaction fee uh, on on a particular transaction. So normally, um, a miner will just mine that transaction and we build on top of it. But uh, but when a transaction is so so juicy. Uh, then you do not have an incentive to actually take that miner's block and build on it. You can say, hey, you know, I, I like playing the lottery. I have some chance of orphaning his block. Um, I will disregard it and try to come up with a longer subchain. And, you know, if I have 10% uh, of the hash rate, well, you know, I have a 1% chance of coming up with a, a sequence of blocks, so, uh, you know, too long, that orphans it. So, um, so I think uh, that's uh, that's you know so that what that causes is when the goose egg hits the network, the network can fracture, where um, people disregard each other's blocks, and it comes together over time as blocks are found and people realize, hey, look, you know, I my chances of actually orphaning uh, this other person's block are very very low. So you can see that this happens when goose eggs hit the network now. Or oh, sorry, that, that this could happen when the goose eggs hit the network now. Um, I haven't seen it happen, actually, so that's, thank God for that. Um, but when the block rewards are zero, then this can actually start to, to play a much bigger role. And uh, the Bitcoin, um, um, uh, sorry, the Princeton colleagues of mine have looked into the, the game theory of this, and it becomes very, very complicated. So um, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, scenario at the end of time, what happens to, to Bitcoin. So um, uh, let's see. I would be interested in whether you have suggestions on guidelines for researchers who, um, uh, who are conducting their research on the live Bitcoin network. Um, I don't know. I think there, is, there are all sorts of ethical issues with doing research on uh, the live Bitcoin network. Um, we try to be good citizens. I know all of my colleagues also try to be good citizens uh, in the sense that, um, that we try not to, by mistake or, uh, or by thoughtlessness, uh, try to DLS the network or, or, try to, or end up exposing uh, data about users that uh, should remain private. I think there are ethical concerns that all too, all too often get uh, swept aside. I think that's uh, everything I have to say, and we're just under time. Excellent. Thank you, Evan Zier. I really appreciate the fact that you've been able to uh, give us such a scientific background into what we're all dealing with with Bitcoin. It's very much appreciated. Thank you very much for having me here.